Okay, so I want to do a quick video going over assembling all the components of the computer. So this is going to be taking everything we've done in the course so far from making logic gates, to copying to logic using LU, to sequential logic with RAM and registers, and all the different components of the assembly language whenever we convert those to binary strings, looking at all the different pieces of data that those strings contain, and how they get transmitted through the computer. So basically, it's just piecing everything together. So let's go and take a look real quick. Hop on over. Okay, so the hack computer consists of three major components. First, ROM, next, CPU, and finally, RAM. We know ROM is just going to be the actual assembly procedures that we create and that we actually run against the computer. So it's going to be those binary strings. That's what gets sent through the computer. So we're going to see how that happens and what individual components that we've made actually process those bits. Next, we have the CPU, and we know that that is going to be a combination of the ALU and some registers, mainly the D and the A register. And then finally, we have RAM, which we know is just that giant stack of 16,384 registers, but also we know it's going to be the screen of the 8,192 various screen registers, along with the final keyboard register, which is just one. So, you can quite easily implement all of this using the previous chapters and a few provided chips. So some of the things we're going to see you don't make, it's provided by Nanda Tetris. So I'll point out which ones those are. It's just maybe like four or five. I forget exactly how many. So at a high level, this is the computer itself. We can see that we have the ROM 32K, CPU, and our memory. So this part, ROM 32K, is provided by Nanda Tetris. It is uh, this line over here. You don't make this. Uh, it is provided by default. You do actually have to write the line and pass the PC, which is the program counter into it, the various instructions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That you actually do, but in terms of making the chip, you don't do that. Now, the CPU and the memory. These are the other two components of this particular project: it is making the actual CPU and then making the memory. You have all the individual components to make these. It's just a matter of piecing everything together, having everything communicate, where we have the instructions going into the CPU, writing to memory, output of memory, the address, program counter, and the actual RAM along the screen and the keyboard over here. So this is just a high level view of everything that's going on. Right, so first things first is going to be the CPU. I mean, the most difficult part by far. And that's just, there's so many parts. So we have the ALU, the AD and PC registers, and then we're gonna have a lot of logic gates. Well, maybe not a lot of logic gates, but a good bit for the jump. More on that later. So I'll break that down step by step because this is kind of the high level view of the CPU. You can see we have a collection of some MUXs. We have the ALU itself. We have the control bits going into the ALU. We have the A register here, D register here, and the program register here for program counter register. And then we have memory address, reset pins, output the program counter. Just there's a lot of things going on. This isn't all of it. This is the high level view. There's actually quite a lot of components that just are not represented in this particular graphic. So, before we can actually begin implementing the CPU, we need to look at the input to it, and that is going to be our humble instructions. So each instruction will be a 16-bit input that is either going to be an A instruction for assignment, a C instruction for computation, and we know that we can look at the 16-bit binary strings to determine which one they are. So. First, before we really get to there, we need to look at the breakdown 
or C instructions. Because we know A instructions, it's just a zero opcode, and then we take the remaining 15 bits, translate that to decimal, and that's it. But for C instructions, it's a lot more nuanced. So we have the opcode. We know it's going to be one. And then we have these two unused bits. We use those for scope of the actual data because we want 16-bit computers, so we need 16 bits. So each instruction has to be 16 bits. For the logic of our computations, we don't need it. So they're just going to be set to one as well. They don't actually get used, so it doesn't really matter. Now we have the A bit or the seven computation bit. This determines if the memory register is used during the ALU operation. This particular one is going to be an input to the select panel on the MUX gate. Most of these are, because we know that these next six bits, the 11 through six, all of these are the input to the ALU functions. And we know each of those are input to MUXs as well. They're just embedded in the ALU. And finally, we have the AD and M register, which we used in the logic to determine if we're actually writing to these registers or not. And finally, we have the last three for the jump bits, and these are not going to be MUXs. These are going to be used in Boolean logic to determine if we are jumping or not. They're going to be used in conjunction with two, uh, two one-bit outputs from the ALU. You'll see a little more on that in just a bit. So. In this order, this is how we're going to look at the CPU. We're going to start with the A register, move on to the D register, the M register, the overall ALU. We're going to take a look at those jump bits, those last three to determine how those work. And finally, we'll handle the program counter. Let's go and start with the A register. So a lot of this just going to be schematics because it's the best way to kind of show how each individual part works and for what purpose. So. First things first, this is the input to the entire actual CPU. So we're not starting out directly with A or C. We have to determine what they are. So that is why we see instruction 15 here. We need to determine, hey, this is instruction, this is the output from the ALU. We know we have zero and one, so zero and one, we know if it's an opcode, then this is instruction 15. So it's just passing in the instruction itself. It's going to do zero. But if it's the actual output in the ALU, it's going to be one. So if it's an actual output in the ALU. And then it's also going to be here for the not gate, which is going to be determining if we actually load something in the A register or not. So if it's a zero, that means it's an A instruction, it's an assignment instruction. So it's going to get getting into one, which means, yeah, this is an A instruction, which you know all assignment instructions back to the A register. That's what that's there for. However, it's doing computation, we know it's going to be a one. So we need to determine, okay, well, well, no, no, it's going to be one coming in, the zero coming out, so zero goes into or. Now we determine, hey, we have a C instruction coming in. Am I writing to the A register? Well, remember that we have the A, D, and M destination bits, and if we have A, D, and M, and we're doing something like uh, D equals one, this is going to be zero. So we do or zeros together, and we don't load something to the A register, right? Well, we do maybe a pointer, A equals M, well, yeah, it's going to be one, because we are actually using A as a destination. So we have zero or with one, and yes, we do end up writing to the A register. So this is how the logic works between handling writing to the A register for assignment instructions, and then writing the register for or the A register itself for computation instructions. So this is a high level kind of look at everything with input actually being loaded in, whether it's the actual instruction for assignments or whether it's the output of the ALU, okay? And then we have class 14 output for the adjustment memory register. And then the overall output is the output of the A register. And they'll get utilized later on. Moving on, we actually have a little bit of a breakdown 
of code here. So A register, we use the opcode to choose between a constant A instruction and the ALU's output for C instructions for the input of the A register, not the opcode determine if an A instruction is being processed. Then when not instruction 15 equals equals one is at out value, which means A should load a value. When instruction five equals equals one, it is A equals out ALU, which means A should load a value. So generally we're going to have a good bit of comments here to kind of really explain what's going on. So final one says loads a new input to the A register if the above code dictates it to, and then we output both to the A register and we set the memory address. We have these two outputs here. Output from the A register, and then we set our actual memory address. You know, if we ever do say at five, well that means that M register and RAM is now five, so that's how this happens with these 14 bits here. So for the D register, a little bit different. We have instruction 15, which we know is the opcode. If it's zero, then we're doing a Simon instruction. So we know the register is not going to be used. So a zero comes out because we're ending with zero. And then we just, we don't load anything. I'll put still from the ALU, but we're not loading anything. Not a big deal. We only have the output from the ALU because the D register is only used in C instructions. Now, if it's a C instruction, then we have one for opcode. And we have AD and M, maybe we're doing M equals negative one, well, this is gonna be zero. So we add those together, and we're not loading anything to D register. All of a sudden, now if we're doing D equals negative one, then this is gonna be one, we add these together, we do load something in the D register, and we look at where the actual output from LU is, it's gonna be negative one. Wouldn't mean this would be all one, so we get loaded into the data register. That's basically this data register, it's not too bad. It's an AND gate for the D register. Oh, previously also, for the D register and the previous A register bits, or gates itself, these are provided, you don't make them, not too bad. So, when instruction four equals equals one, it is D equals out ALU, which means that D register should load a value. Loads a new input to the D register if above code dictates it to, since the ALU X input to D, because remember, looking at the ALU, get the X input, get the Y input, now that this is D, know that this is A for M. But enough of that. Moving on, we have the very simple M register. And this is a little bit different because there's no specific actual A register or D register. It's not a static register. It's just writing to a particular memory location, which we already determined previously was set by the for the 0 0.14 from the A register that was setting the memory location. So if we do something like you know, negative one, well, we know that this is the instruction that was one. We have instruction three, well, that's M, so this is one, and those together, and all of a sudden, yeah, we're going to write to memory, which will get handled later. So it's just uh, when instruction three equals equals one, it is M equals out ALU which means M should load a value. And that, that's as simple as it can get. However, now we have the ALU, which is anything but simple. But it's not really that bad. So if we look at it, first thing we're gonna look at is out D. This is that X input to the ALU that we talked about earlier. We know that every ALU computation is going to use this. May not actually do anything with it, but it does have the output from the data register going into it. So that is why we have the X and in X input being the output of the data register right here. And then we have this MUC 16. So we have the output of the A register. We have NM, which is the memory that's being input to the ALU. So basically we're going to choose between whatever is in the A register and whatever is in our current memory register. So one of these two is going to be the Y input to the ALU. And we use this 
in conjunction with the actual A bit of the computation bits, that 12th instruction bit, because we know that if it's one, that means M is being used in the computation, but maybe it's D plus M because this is one. If it's zero, then it'd be D plus A because we're using the A register. So that is why we care about that being one slash zero because it determines are we using A register or are we using M register? And so we have out A M. Then we know we've already been over the AOU I'm not going to touch too much on the computation bits. It's a ZX, NX, ZY, NY function, and NO bits. However, we have the ZR and the NG outputs here. They will be seen again momentarily. And then finally, we have the two outputs, two 16-bit outputs, out ALU, out M. So this is, if you recall in the high level graphic, the output of the ALU gets passed back into the input of the CPU, back into the A register, and this is where it comes from, the output of the ALU. We have out M to whatever we would write to memory. And again, it looks complicated. It's literally just two different gates. So we have mug 16, which sets the ALU Y input to other A or M, RAM A, and set the ALU appropriately, which is just setting all the different inputs of X and Y, then the function bits, then our outputs. So nothing too much of the code here. Now, the jump bits, zero and negative. So we can determine if the output of the ALU is zero and negative based on how we wrote it back in chapter two. However, we don't have any way of determining it as positive, but we know very easily how to do that because if it's not zero and it's not negative, then it has to be positive. So if we arm together, we just say that, yep, zero is zero, so it's not zero, it's not negative. Arm together, we get zero. The only way to get zero and then negate that all of a sudden it's positive. So zero, it's not zero, it's not negative, it's positive. However, if it is zero, or these together, get a one, positive, so it's zero, it's not negative, and not positive. Same thing, if it's negative, not positive, not zero. So that's how we determine the polarity, not a big deal. That's the first part of the jump. So let's go ahead and go to the next part. Okay. So this is how we have a relation between positive, zero, negative, greater than, equal to, and less than, because we're always comparing against the value of zero. And this is why, because this is very simple logic, we know very well that all these polarities have a direct correlation with the value of zero. And it's really not too hard from there because we have the jump bits. We know that greater than is the zero. We have JQ is the first and less than is the second. So we know we only have one of these will ever be set. Multiple of these will be set. So let's, let's think about this real quick. Okay, if I'm doing the JLE, right? And my output, or whatever's in the data, data register here is, is like say, um, six. Six is not less than equal to zero. So we're not gonna jump. So let's take a look at, at why, okay? So my instructions are gonna be, let's just do, now it's L-E-G, right? So LE110. So my zeroth bit is zero. And it's positive. So this is zero and one. And those together we get zero instructions. One, one. We know it's positive, so it's not zero. And it's not negative. So all of these are zero. We are not going to jump. However, if I make this negative six, well, it's not positive it's negative, 
this is zero and it was zero still zero one and it was zero is still zero but one and it with one one so we will jump in this case conversely if we do oh we go to equals one where we are not jumping at all well maybe d is set to and it's positive zero 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 everything is zero so since all of the instruction bits are zero we will not jump same thing whenever we have say zero j and p reason we don't care about this at all because this is all going to be one So one, one, one. Okay, well, the output of the LU is zero. One, this should be zero, this should be zero. So we have a jump. And if I did, no, no. One, well, one, zero. Zero, I'm gonna jump. I do negative one. Zero, one. I still end up with a jump. There's no way with all three of these bits being one that I won't jump. So it's just kind of how this lines up. So moving on, we see how this jump works. So let's say I did one uh, JMP, okay? Well, the output of jump greater than is going to be 1 because it was positive, so we added together. It was 1. We didn't get this. We didn't get this. So we or everything together. Well, it's 1. Now, notice, and. This AND gate right here is very, very critical because we need to make sure that we are doing a computation instruction to jump because if we're doing a assignment instruction we're not jumping we don't care what any of these bits are we're just saying something to a register and ignoring everything else we end it with zero so even if all this ends up correlating to we might jump the one here we get a zero here because we are doing a instruction we are not jumping and it sets that to false so this is the boolean logic i was talking about previously where Everything has to go through some logic gates to determine if we are or if we are not jumping. We use ALU's outputs to do so. So this is honestly some of the most complex code for the CPU. So jump zero or with negative ALU flags to determine if neither is true. That gives us positive. Negate the result determines positive. Well, yeah, once we negate it, it gives positive. And then we AND together for out ALU is greater than zero equal to zero or less than zero. Then we combine the bits, determine if we're jumping, and then we end it with the up code to determine should we jump at all. Okay, so now we have the PT register. This is going to be kind of review just on how the program kind of works. We've already seen this before, not a big deal. First things first, we know we're always recommending, so that's why this is set to true, basically just a one. Not a big deal. The input to it is the output from the A register. So if we did something like five, register five or memory location five is what is being loaded into the P register, PC register. But we may not always set to load that. This is just what's being passed in. Whether it is what gets used is determined by this input. And we know how to set jump based on the previous jump bits that we just went over. So it goes in order from here to here to here on priority. So we're always incrementing. So if we went, I don't know, there's always one. We're not resetting, we're not jumping. Then we're just gonna have six is the actual output. That's what gets passed out from the program counter. That's about it. So let's say if we are resetting, then we have zero come out. Because it's resets, gets zero. Program counter has zero come out. So 
zero here, one, well, five comes out. And technically, when I did this increment, I was assuming it was already set to five. But let's say I was currently in instruction, I don't know, 12. So five is coming in, so it says, hey, I might be jumping to five, but currently I'm not jumping at all because it's zero. So I get 13, maybe I get 14, 15, so on and so forth. And all of a sudden jump gets set to one. Well now, instead of going to 17, I go to five. I go to six, so on and so forth. So program flow is dictated directly by the program counter. So it's either incrementing, resetting back to zero, or jumping into whatever address is output from the ALU, or not the ALU, the A register, my bad based on the outputs from the ALU and the jump bits. So that's program counter, not too big of a deal, just a single line. It takes in the A register, jump result, reset input, and increment, which is always true, to determine where the next address in ROM32K should be. If jump equals equals one, PC equals out A. We jump to ROM A. Else if reset equals equals one, PC equals zero, we jump to ROM zero. Else PC equals PC plus one, in which case we increment to our next address. And that's pretty much a program counter. Not too bad. That's it for the CPU. Moving on, we're going to have memory. This is significantly easier than the CPU as there's only three components to worry about, that being the RAM 16K that we made in chapter three, and a screen, the keyboard, which we looked at in chapter four. Again. Screen and keyboard are going to be components that are given to you. You have to make them from scratch, so it's not a big deal. In addition, we also have some DMUXs and some MUX16s. This is like which of these we're going to be using. Now, before we can look into that, let's take a look at the breakdown of how this works. So we know right off the bat, we have 16K RAM to work with. That is zero. There's 16,383. We look at that very, very closely. We can determine that the address is a 15-bit input. We have 15 bits to work with. So, if we're in RAM 16K, we know that we have two to the 14, because this is 16,384. And we know that zero would be zero, or all zeros would be zero. All ones would be 16,383. So that's how we determine where in RAM we are. Now, the way we determine where we are in screen is a little bit different. Because in RAM, you have all that to work with. You have all 14 bits to work with, not a big deal. Zero is zero. One is the maximum value here. But with screen, we have a different starting point. We're gonna have to use a specific bit to determine that we're not in maybe address of 100 of RAM 16K, but we're at address 100 of the screen. So one of those bits is gonna be used to determine where we're in the screen. But the other one we have to the 13 instead because that's 8192, we can determine that's 8K. So zero in this case, all zeros for these bits would be zero. And then all ones would instead be 8191. So that's how we determine where in screen we are compared to where in RAM we are. So that's where those DMUXs are going to be used for. And then lastly, if we exceed past screen, we'll have two bits used to determine that we are at the keyboard because there's just one register for it. So let's look at what I mean by all of that. So right off the bat, we can see that we have two DMUXs and this is what we're going to use to determine where in memory we are loading data to, if we're loading at all. So we know we have a 15-bit input. So we're gonna look at the first bit of that. So that most significant bit, that's the first thing we're gonna look at. So it's gonna be a one or a zero. Take a look if it's zero. So it's zero, RAM load. Look at RAM because we can determine that it's going to be zero and then some numbers. So the most significant is not high enough for us to exceed RAM 16K's contiguous memory block. Now, 
the moment that changes though and we get one well it's not going to go here it's going to go here into this demux and it's going to choose to uh, do screen or this null pin we'll let null pin in just a second but if it's one followed by a zero then whatever data this is is going to be like location and screen so if we exceed this memory block as well we we'll get one one on this address 13 which is what we're looking at right then we have one here well then we load this null pin so this one one combination is the keyboard and we don't load data into the keyboard register, we read from it. So we won't be loading anything, hence why we just use a null pin. It's still necessary to output something here for the DMUX for it to be a proper gate. It just means we are not going to actually use that. Now, moving on, we have some pretty in-depth comments here. So we have if address 14 equals zero, we are using the RAM. So we're going to do RAM load. Otherwise, we are going to be using the screen of the keyboard, so we create something called SK load. Those will be the inputs to this DMUX. Now, if our address 14 equals 1, which is this else statement, then we look at address 13 now. So if address 13 equals 0, we are using screen load, else we are using the keyboard and we don't use the load input, hence we use no pin. So that's the general case of determining where in memory we are wanting to load data if we're loading at all. So, moving on, we have the RAM 16K. This is what we did make in project three. So, as RAM load, which would be a one or a zero if we're loading anything, input of whatever we might be loading, and then the actual address, which would be zero through 13, because we know the 14th bit is going to be zero. So it's already being used to determine that this is that register and we just care what register inside of this are we using and then we have ram out so gone we have the screen load which has a one or a zero for are we loading in the screen the actual input and then a zero through 12 because again the 13th bit is going to be one here and that will give us whatever location and screen that we're looking at. Now, it has screen out, but for keyboard, it's just reading from keyboard. Now, previous slide, you had screen. Again, another gate that's given to you, it's just like keyboard here, not the gate that's given to you. And it's just constantly outputting keyboard out. It's constantly adjusting from another part of the system, so. That's fine, you have RAM out, screen out, keyboard out, and we have a little bit of logic here, which is just RAM 16K using the aforementioned RAM load in the first 14 bits of the address, RAM 8K, which is screen, using the aforementioned screen in the first 13 bits of the address, and then a simple keyboard out. It's just, just, just the output of the keyboard, not a big deal. And then here we have two MUX 16s, which are kind of a mirror to our first DMUXs. We have address 14, which you know if that is zero, we're using A, which is RAM out. However, it's one, we're using B, which needs to be determined over here. So we're looking at screen out or keyboard out. And if it's zero, it's screen out. So we would have screen out as the actual output. And if it's one as well, then we end up with keyboard output as the output. So this is some MUX logic to determine which of the three we're actually using based on how far in that contiguous memory block we are. And then we have if address 13 equals zero, we're using the screen. Otherwise, we're using the keyboard. And if address 14 equals zero, we're using RAM. Otherwise, we're using whatever the result from SK load was, the screen of the keyboard. That's pretty much it. That is basically the gist of everything for the computer. There's a whole lot of moving parts, but that's because it's a culmination of four projects. One, the logical gate we put together. Two, the alien the combination of logic we made. 
read the registers and RAM that we made for sequential logic, and then finally, all the different various parts of the assembly instructions when it's translated to binary. So just a lot of things going on, but they all have some genuine purpose in the overall system. So hopefully everything here made sense. Hopefully the actual term computer organization makes sense here as well, because this is the point where understanding that name comes into play because it's organizing all the various components into some overall schematic and then organizing where the bits translated from assembly get put in the computer because they all go to some very particular component. Everything is very, very purposely made. So overall, hope everything made sense. I hope you learned something. I'll see you in the next video.